Welcome to the Teacher Rockstar Podcast, the podcast that's dedicated to providing valuable insights, practical tips, and proven strategies to equip new teachers for success. I'm your host, Steve Hiles, retired educator, published author, and instructional coach. Join me in each episode as we offer a supportive platform for navigating the challenges of the teaching profession. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing classroom management through the lens of community and leadership. But before we get into today's topic, I'd like to take a moment to share a little bit about today's special guest. Dr. Cheryl Blanklin is a former Director of Student Services and a nationally certified school psychologist. Currently, she serves as an adjunct professor for Ramapo College of New Jersey, where she teaches in the Master of Arts in Special Education program. Along with teaching and providing professional learning, Blankman works directly with schools and districts to develop, implement, and strengthen high-quality, inclusive educational systems and programs by connecting research and practice. Welcome to the Teacher Rockstar Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hiles, and today we're going to be discussing classroom management through the lens of community and leadership with our special guest today, Dr. Cheryl Blankman, who currently serves as an adjunct professor for Ramapo College of New Jersey, where she teaches in the Master of Arts in Special Education program. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Steve. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm excited that you're on. Um, uh, Cheryl, would you like to take a moment to maybe tell the audience uh, what got you in education and your journey? Um, so I'll, I'll try to make it a quick story, but the truth is I started out uh, in psychology. And if I go way back, I thought that I was going to be a clinical psychologist. Hmm. And it wasn't until my college years that I started to realize that what I was really fascinating with, fascinated by, my big question is how do we become who we are? I've always been fascinated with how each person becomes whoever it is that we are and how we fit into the world. And so um, when I was in college, I did some volunteer work at an elementary school that was right off my college campus. Mm -hmm. And between working with the kids and being in the school environment, and then my, my bachelor's is in psychology, my psychology degree, and kind of that question of learning and development, I yeah. found myself um, going in the direction of school psychology. And so I did become a school psychologist. I am a nationally school certified school psychologist. I maintain that certification even a quarter century later today. <laughs> um, I worked for a long time in public education. I've always worked with the whole gamut of preschool all the way up through age 21 because wow. in special education <laughs> and special ed, our students sometimes stay with us, you know, past that traditional 18, 19 year old 12th grade year and have a few more years of additional education. Um, and along the way, I had a lot of great opportunities um, to explore leadership myself. And it turns out I'm a little bit of a leadership junkie. <laughs> and so that took me in a direction of administration. Um, so I made the move from school psychologist to director of student services and also director of special services. I've served that role in a couple places oh. in different states actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was actually again through some volunteer and activist work working with the New Jersey Council for Exceptional Children that I first became connected with the leadership at Ramapo College of New Jersey. And that turned into this incredible opportunity to work as an adjunct professor in the Master of Special Education program, which is maybe one of the best things I've ever had the chance to do in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, and here I am. So at this point, I've actually stepped away from a full-time position in public education. I work as a, in my professorship with, mm -hmm. um, with Ramapo College. And I do a lot of training and consulting. Um, I work with districts and schools and um, learning organizations mm -hmm. to strengthen inclusion, um, to strengthen special education programs and services, and to try to bridge that gap between 
the science of learning and development, the science of what we know of teaching and learning um, into the, the hands and minds of our teachers and leaders in our classrooms and our schools who most need that information and often have the least direct route yeah. to being able to access that. You know, so it's so a little bit of a long answer to a short question, but, but that's kind of how I got from here to there. And I will candidly share with your with your listeners that um, along with all of that, I am a special ed parent myself. Mm. And so um, I, I have the lenses from from different seats at the table. Um, and truthfully, for all of my my education and all of my years of experience and the roles and responsibilities that I have fulfilled for organizations and, and for families, I've never once gone into an IEP meeting as a special ed mom without a knot in my stomach. Mm. So, Well, I'll tell you, I have to say that what an incredible journey. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, I read, I was really struck by one of, uh, well, this particular article that you wrote, uh, referencing clip charts. And that's yeah. what I wanted to kind of kick off. Uh, I mean, uh, it was really just profound to me. But clip charts are a popular method, you know, for many teachers to manage student behavior. Uh, can you speak to why now clip charts can destroy classroom culture. You know, some t teachers use the clip charts with the with the uh, little clothes pins, and some just have the little different colored cards that they put in different pockets. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I love that the clip chart article kind of brought us together, mm -hmm. Steve. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is a really, really, um, it's such a concrete example of those bigger conversations and some of the bigger things that, we know about teaching and learning in terms of the sort of the, the research and, and the frameworks that don't always make its way in translation into a classroom environment. And I work with a lot of new teachers at the beginning of their career mm -hmm. who all want wonderful relationships, who all want the best for their students, and also still kind of have that secret fear coming into the classroom of things just turning to chaos. Yes. <laughs> right? And so the, the clip charts, for your listeners who aren't as familiar, sometimes may have seen um, a lot of times they're, they're in the format of like a, almost like a poster, mm -hmm. you know, or more like a ladder that is posted somewhere in the classroom and in the middle of it, it may have, you know, some language that says things like ready to learn, <laughs> um, you know, and then as, as you go up the ladder, it's um, language about, you know, being a really good listener or being, you know, excellent in terms of, you know, behavior. Uh -huh. And then as you go down the ladder, you see things like warnings and, you know, and if you get to the red zone, you're going to get a phone call home or, you know, or something like that. Um, one of the things that makes that kind of behavior system so dangerous is the publicity of it. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, a system like that is aimed at compliance, which is different from engagement. Yes, it is. Right? It's aimed at trying to, to just sort of control for problematic behaviors, right? Right. That idea of management, we'll talk about that more in a minute, which is very different from how am I going to inspire or encourage or create conditions that maximize engagement, you know, and we know we need good engagement for learning, right? Mm -hmm. There's no question about yeah. that. Right. Well, one of the other things that is a non-negotiable prerequisite for learning is psychological safety, you know, and so we think about safety sometimes, and unfortunately, Safety is often a conversation in our schools over the last two decades or so about physical safety. Yeah. Right? yeah. I'm now teaching graduate students who grew up doing these safety drills, right? Who grew mm -hmm. up doing active shooter drills and, and things like that in our schools. So safety has been a big conversation on the physical side that's really maybe even dominated what we think about as safety for for. 20 some years now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but psychological safety, that sense of being in an environment that is socially and emotionally safe, an environment where you belong, 
where you are valued and respected and accepted, where you can be who you are without fear of, of judgment, yeah. without fear of exclusion or rejection. Um, that is as important as, as the physical safety when it comes to students learning, right? Our brains actually respond to both threats in the same way. So these clip charts that are a public commentary mm -hmm. on student behavior are really based in shame. They're based in trying to shame students into complying, right? Yeah. And that element of students feeling like not only is it, it's a little, it, there's an impersonality part of it in terms of students really understanding what the desired behaviors are and what might be the, the, the behaviors of concern. Like when, when what we're doing is focusing on clipping a student up and down, mm -hmm. what we're not doing is focusing on that relationship and the kind of feedback that students need to be able to learn and grow, um, yeah. to, to cultivate those behaviors, but also, you know, you just create this situation where even kids who are at the tippy top, you know, who, who might be at purple or pink or whatever the top of the chart is, they know the only place they've got to go is down. And there's an ongoing pressure to try to keep themselves at that top level. And yeah. then you've got kids who are never going to reach the top level, you know, and it creates, uh, it really undermines the sense of psychological safety and community in the classroom when students are in that position of, you know, we know who the kids are that never do what they're supposed to do. Or yeah. I know when I'm the kid who's never going to hit pink, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so there's all kinds of, of concerns and, 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 um, complexities built up in there. But the bottom line of it comes down to, if we want 21st century teaching and learning, if we want deep learning and we want students to be able to de develop both the, the interpersonal skills that they need with one another mm -hmm. and the intrapersonal skills of things like self-awareness and self-regulation and yeah. self-direction and self-management, psychological safety is non-negotiable. Okay, point well taken. Well, then what is a new teacher to do? I mean... Yeah. Uh, you, you, you have to have a, I would say, a positive classroom management plan. You have to have a plan. So how do they keep track of that if it's not with, a, you know, flipping, um, you know, little strips into right. uh, library charts or, or clips? What do they do? It's such a good question. Um, and it is, again, it, it's for a lot of teachers, that's the thing that has the butterflies in their stomach mm -hmm. coming in. Absolutely. You know, coming in, right? Because we can't get to all of that curriculum unless yeah. things are going right. well in the classroom in terms of, of behavior. Yeah. Um, I think part of the, the conversation I'd like for, for teachers to think about is to shift thinking from this idea of sort of a management mindset to a mindset of, of cultivating uh -huh. uh, a positive learning environment because they're not two sides of the same coin. Um, think about the things we manage. So you manage your diabetes, uh -huh. you manage your finances so you don't get into enormous debt and you can't uh -huh you know, pay your bills, right? Maybe you're trying to manage your diet so that you, you know, you, you still fit into your skinny jeans, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. But when we talk about things that we're going to manage, we tend to be thinking about either a problem we're trying to control or contain or something that we are perceiving as a potential problem that we want to keep under wraps, right? Mm. That is a different way of thinking from thinking about how am I going to create a healthy environment, an environment that is grounded in the things that students need in order for this to be a learning organization, a learning community, a place where we work together and we support one another. And we are all um, on the same page and working towards some common purpose with some common values and we're going to get ourselves from here to there in a, a team sort of approach, a team mindset. Yeah. Um, and so some of the, 
the, you know, the first thing that that takes is really making a deliberate decision that says, I want a classroom community that is a true learning community where we're going to have norms and expectations. Mm -hmm. We're going to have shared understanding. We're going to have common goals and also our own individual goals. We're going to be built on strong relationships, you know, and making a commitment to create those things. You know, we a lot of times teachers have great vision of what an ideal classroom, you know, might look like. Mm-hmm. The trick is, how are you going to get from here to there? Yeah. Um, yeah. And creating a learning environment like that is something that that we know have strategies to accomplish. So when we start out by focusing on relationship with relationships with our students, but also amongst our students, mm-hmm. and we do things like start out the year by talking about what we're here to do. Yeah. The learning we're here to do, the growing we're here to do, what, you know, we're starting third grade, fourth grade, 10th grade. What is it that we want to accomplish over the course of this year? And then, so what is that going to mean for us when we're in here? What what kind of environment allows you to do your best work? What kind of environment is a place where I feel well, where I feel safe, where I feel like I can be myself. And when we get students engaged in those conversations, and I promise you, your four-year-olds in pre-K all the way up through your seniors in high school are all very well prepared to, they have ideas (laughs) and they have good ideas about what is necessary in order to be in an environment where you can be your best self, where everybody belongs, where everybody's respected, And then as teachers, we hone that, right? Mm -hmm. And we do things like create those classroom sets of expectations and norms that everybody agrees on. And sometimes we call it a contract or a compact or a constitution or, you know, Uh whatever it may be, but it's the the same idea. Yeah, Um, and those kinds of things could be put on maybe an anchor chart. Absolutely. You know, uh, where people can actually, well, your kids could actually see it. Yeah, yes. I posted it in a public place. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then the next step in that is more so often with our younger kids, but not to be underestimated or taken for granted at any age level is great. We talked about it, but now how do you actually do that? Mm-hmm. What does it actually mean? You, you will have a bunch of six-year-olds tell you, like possibly, that we need to be respectful of one another. That doesn't mean we all know what that looks Me, like, sounds right. like, feels like. And so taking the time to teach it, mm-hmm. to practice it, to let the kids really, we call it operationalizing when we go from an idea into like the talking to the walking, mm-hmm. right? We talk, we talk, we need to figure out how to walk That's that right. walk. Um, but we, we can't miss that step of making it real. And then we have to reinforce. Then we have to reinforce. Okay. Um, So, yeah, it it sounds like a lot, and I don't want to pretend that it's not a lot, but it also is all stuff we can totally do. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this. How can fostering, you know, a a sense of community uh, in the classroom contribute to effective classroom management, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because some of it is just sort of, it's actually like the laws of physics. Like the more we're doing what we need to be doing, the less opportunity there is to be doing things we shouldn't be doing, Mm -hmm. right? So the more that we are um, using respectful language, that we are staying within the norms and expectations that we've designed in the classroom, the more that we adhere to the boundaries and routines and structures that we've put in place and that we have a shared understanding of, Mm -hmm. the more that we're doing those things organically, the less we will be doing things that are contrary to all of those things. Um, And sometimes we really underestimate the simplicity. There's some really good um, research out there um, as recently as uh, um, I just saw an article I think it was Cook was the was the lead was the first author. It was 2018, 
on how just the way we, when we greet children at the door. Oh, yeah. Greet them by name. And in an ideal world, you know, with a, a handshake or a high five or, you know, how can I greet you today? Uh-huh. The research tells us that just standing at the door and greeting our students when they come into the classroom increases how quickly they go for the transition from coming into the classroom to getting into whatever the activities are that we want them doing that day. Mm -hmm. It increases engagement and it decreases disruptive behavior. All of those things linked just to instead of being at your desk or or somewhere in the classroom trying to finish that one last thing as kids are coming in, which we all do, (laughs) but positioning yourself in a place where you're greeting students at the door by name and welcoming them into the classroom environment. Because when we feel known and seen Mm -hmm. and valued and welcomed, we work harder. Absolutely. I'll tell you, that's a, that's a good point there. And and thank you for, um, you know, talking about that. Um, Let me ask you this, uh, Cheryl, in what ways uh, do strong leadership skills play a role, you know, in creating a positive and inclusive classroom environment? Mm -hmm. So I'm big on inclusivity. I will I will say that to me, <laughs> inclusivity is all it's an equity issue. Inclusive yeah. equals equity. That's all there is to it. And part of that, aside from sort of the, the morality of it for people who, you know, feel that way, mm-hmm. like me, um, <laughs> it's brain based. You know, we become who we are. Our brains develop as a um, result of the interaction between us and our biology and our neurology and our neurochemistry and our context, our environment around us. So who each of our students is going to be is is in that space between who they who they are inside coming into us Mm -hmm. and the environment that's created for them. And so when we start to have conversations about inclusivity and about um, whether it's students with special needs who we literally may be looking to educate in other environments or the cultural differences and all the backgrounds that that come into our classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, Inclusivity, it is directly tied to human development. So we have to be really respectful of that and and take it seriously. Um, I told you I'm a little bit of a leadership junkie, right? So one of the one of the great gurus in leadership is is a gentleman named John Maxwell. And he has a quote that I love that says, everything rises and falls on leadership. Right. And in our classrooms, that's our teachers. Yeah. Yeah. We we have to own that in the classroom. We set the tone we set the structures, we arrange the furniture, you know, we, we make a lot of decisions as the, the leaders in our immediate environment. And so really understanding that and, and thinking about what makes a great leader and learning the skills of strong leadership, leadership's a skill set. We can all learn it. We can all practice it. We can all improve at it. We can all get better at it, reflect on it. We just have to think about it, not as being like I was born a leader or not born a leader. Right. You know, as opposed, you know, thinking about it as as leadership being something we we can learn and we can hone. Um, and so, good communication and understanding sort of those elements that make a community. Um, those are the things that, that teachers need to do as leaders so that they can set those conditions in place for their students. Absolutely. Well, let me uh, ask you this, you know, how, how can teachers balance the need for structure and discipline, mm-hmm. okay, with building a sense of community among students? Because I know for me, I know when I first started, I, I, I really, I'm just a structured, per, you know, yeah. uh, person, you know. <laughs> I love, love, love this question because they're not opposed. Okay. You know, it, this is, it's not a choice. There's no binary decision to be made here between structure and discipline and a strong learning community. In fact, you cannot have a strong learning community without having 
some really good structures in mm-hmm. place. And if we if we think about discipline not as a punishment thing, yeah, but as when we think about self discipline, right, or we think about um, the the sense of regulation and discipline being something we practice, being something we want to get better at. Um, what is my discipline, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that helps us maybe to, to bridge that conversation into strong community, but kids need structure. We crave, they, we crave, we all do. We crave boundaries. We crave structure. If you think about, think about yourself sitting on a chair in the middle of a dark room, right? Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? You're going to, you're, well, some of us are going to sit there. Other ones are going to get up and explore. We all have our own personality, right? Us in the environment. But as you maybe get up out of your chair, you're feeling your arms around trying to figure out where things are. Um, picture for a moment when your hand hits the wall, you know, when you, when you feel something. Mm-hmm. Now you know where a boundary is, right? It's Absolutely. helping you to, to put a sense of control of awareness, of understanding, of the environment that you're in. And we need that in our classrooms terribly. Kids need to know where the boundaries are. We need to know what the structures are. And Uh I'll tell you that having good routines, um, kids coming in and knowing where to go and what to do. And when we transition from activity to activity, that we know how to do that, those are really important parts of one, the community, because part of being part of a community means you know what's going on in there. Right. <laughs> right? If you think about what it's like to go somewhere for the first time and go somewhere new and be in a new environment with lots of new people where everybody else seems to know what's going on and you don't feel like you know what's going on, you recognize it when you start to feel like you know what's going on too. Mm-hmm. And that's part of feeling included. That's part of a sense of belonging. I belong. One of the reasons I belong is because I know how we do things in here. Right. 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 And so they go together. They go together. Setting up firm structures, setting up good routines, having clear expectations, having boundaries. You can't have a relationship without having good boundaries, right? A healthy relationship has healthy boundaries. That's right. And so all of those things are part of the recipe for how we get to strong classroom community. As a teacher, finding high-quality, time-saving educational resources can be a constant struggle. Crafting lessons, sub-plans, and seasonal activities that engage students while staying aligned with curriculum standards is a common challenge. Imagine a teaching environment where educators have easy access to a wealth of top-notch educational content, fostering a culture of continuous learning and innovation. Our membership program is the solution to your quest for comprehensive, time-saving educational materials. Choose from three plans tailored to your preferences, each offering a curated selection of lessons, sub-plans, seasonal activities, top-rated educational podcasts, articles, and teacher videos. Ready to transform your teaching with a diverse array of resources? Use the link in the podcast description to explore our membership program. Choose from three plans to fit your preferences and enjoy a seven-day free trial to experience the value firsthand. Thank you for that. Let me, let me, uh, can you speak to this? Uh, you know, like what specific strategies can educators actually do to promote student engagement and collaboration, you know, as part mm-hmm. of classroom leadership, you know? So one of the things that we that happens in the very beginning, if we take the time to invest in having those early conversations about what we want our community to look like and sound like and feel like, mm-hmm. is that one, we are getting students engaged, right? That's, that's student voices, that's student decision-making, that's students who are identifying with those core values. Those are students that are helping to set the priorities And when it comes from them, there's a lot of buy-in that is different from what happens when, like my seventh grade Spanish teacher spent the first 45 minutes of our first day of class with a stack of three by five cards in front of her, just telling us what all the rules were for the year. 
right? Yeah. That's different than, than when we have a conversation where we all contribute. Yeah. You know, when we contribute, we have a sense of ownership. And when we have ownership, we have elevated engagement, right? So all of these things happen kind of naturally. And the same conversation is a collaborative conversation. We're co-constructing norms and expectations in our classroom. Um, and then um, when we do things like, so one of the things that's really important, important in a community is that we celebrate, right? In a community, one of the things that we do is celebrate our successes. You know, and we might have certain rituals, certain ways that we celebrate. Your listeners who have been part of a team might have had a team chant. You know, mm-hmm. or a special like dance or, you know, something that, that, and that's part of, again, this is part of us as a community because it's our thing, right? That's our right. thing that we do. And so teachers and, and within our classroom communities, we can identify ways that we want to celebrate our community. And now we get back, we can come like all the way back around to that conversation about like, where those clip charts came from and the things that we're trying to achieve. Because one of the systems that will work in our classrooms are to have classroom contingency systems. And these can be systems where we agree as a class that these are the norms and expectations that we're here to follow that we're going to adhere to. And we agree as a class that these are goals we're trying to achieve. And then we agree on ways we're going to celebrate ourselves for our good decision-making, for our hard work, for our progress, for being a great community mm-hmm. as we accomplish all of that. And those become, you know, great things like, and, and this is, you know, teachers can figure out how they want to do this. It can be, you know, uh, marble jars and it can be, um, you know, my, I, I told you once about my son's second grade teacher who had the alphabet across the the top of the whiteboard in the classroom. Uh Kids brought in pictures from home to be the marker that moved across the alphabet. But but it was as we were doing what we're supposed to be doing, Uh as we are doing the things that allow us to achieve our goals, the things that help us be great learners, the ways we support one another, as we're doing all that good stuff. That we acknowledge it, we validate it, we celebrate it, and then ultimately we celebrate even bigger, right? Yeah. And we're, yeah. And we're all in on it, so it's okay if today's not my best day, right? I didn't have to be perfectly on it every single day, you know. And yeah. and, and it's okay if tomorrow is not your best day. Maybe I'll be having a better day and you'll be the one who needs a little extra help and support tomorrow. And that's okay because we're going to celebrate what's working. And in the end, we're all part of it together. Right. You know? So and it's a lot of fun if you're the only class who gets to wear your pajamas to school while everybody else <laughs> has to wear their regular clothes. Yeah, right? Absolutely. So what I got from that uh, was giving children choice and voice. Yes. And, uh, maybe having them be active participants in establishing classroom rules where you Absolutely. get that buy-in, right? Absolutely. Okay. I know as a first year teacher, and sometimes I could cringe when I think back on it. I, I know when I heard early in my years, I'll be honest with you, I had the rules already posted because I wanted to hit the ground running and, 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 and all that, you know, but, but then as time went on, you know, we kind of shifted gears and I did uh, in, have them help develop, you know, kind of, guide them to Uh, well sure i mean i don't want to make it sound like teachers don't have a voice as well yeah (laughs) you know what you need your classroom to look like you know what some of the things are that you're looking for and part of the trick is to make sure the conversation gets there right right absolutely well this leads me to ask you uh this uh cheryl how does the concept of community and uh leadership in the class extend beyond the teacher student uh, relationship to include peer interactions? It is such an incredibly important question, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, cause this is what it is, right? When I, when I do trainings, a lot of times we start out just talking about, you know, what do we want our students to have gained from us at the end of the year? Or what does it mean to be successful as educators, you know, and nobody ever answers that with things like, 
my students are going to be able to multiply and divide fractions really, really well by the end of the year, right? What it's all about is creating healthy, productive citizens, you know, mm -hmm. student people. We're trying to create healthy, productive, well-functioning contributors to society right. who are going to be able to go out there and do all the incredible things that they want to do and that we need them to do, right? Because let's remember, right now, we're working with students who we need to educate to be able to solve problems that we haven't even invented yet <laughs> that yeah. we're still creating right now with technology that they're going to have to create in order to solve those problems so the the expectations the needs are the demand is on right yeah it's absolutely high. yeah high. and so in an ideal world that strong classroom community is part of a larger strong school community right it's a wonderful thing when those core values and classroom norms are something that come out of the foundation of school-wide values and school-wide norms and district values and district norms. And we know that when we include parents in the conversation and we have good communication and transparency, student experiences, student achievement, that's all elevated. Mm -hmm. Right. So we need those yeah. connections. We want those connections. Um, and when we think about the way that students are going to, you know, engage and interact with one another, um, I guess one of the things that's important for us to remember is that there's a difference between rules and norms. Right. Like we are social beings mm -hmm. and we live by norms. You know, so the rule on the highway might be 55 miles an hour. But if everybody around you is driving more like 65 miles an hour, yeah. chances are you're going to find wherever you're comfortable that's a little more towards that 65 than it is towards that 55, right? Because that's the norm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So as leaders, as teachers, we have to pay attention to not just what we say are the, the rules that we want, mm -hmm. but how of how those norms are actually implemented in the classroom so that if we say we're going to be good listeners then that what does that mean yeah and then as the as the leader how do i reinforce that you know because if i have a student talking and other students rolling their eyes and talking behind that student's back then that is not living up to that norm right and if i let that go then the norm that actually gets created is it's okay to roll your eyes and yeah. talk behind people's backs. And we can't do that. Right. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I have to ask you this. How, can you provide some examples, okay, of successful classroom management approaches uh, that prioritize community building and leadership over traditional disciplinary yes. methods? Yes. So one of the things that I, I think that that question leads us to is a conversation about the kind of feedback that we give. Um, that, you know, what we, we have to remember, first of all, that whatever we reinforce, we get more of. That's like the fundamental rule of behavior is whatever we reinforce, we get more of. And reinforcement just means that we are, it can mean something as simple as paying attention to it. Right. So we have to think about what it is that we want more and more of in our classroom. And then we have to think about how we communicate with students and give feedback to students in ways that are going to produce more of the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so effective feedback, strategic feedback means that, first of all, we're tuned in to what we want to see. And then we take the time to let students know specifically what they were doing that was right, what they were doing that was helpful, what they were doing that we want more of, and why it was important. So feedback to a student that says, I really appreciated that when we were leaving the classroom, you held the door for everyone so that we could get out of the classroom, you know, quicker and oh, wow. more efficiently and be on our way. And that not only, you know, was helpful to me because it let me, 
you know, get our class moving down the hall. Mm-hmm. But it was a really respectful and, and kind thing that you did for the whole class. Thanks yes. for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so you're, yeah. it's, it's what was the behavior and why did it matter? Right. And then on the flip side, look, we're talking about human beings here and we're talking about kids here and we're going to get behavior we don't want. Mm-hmm. We're going to get things that don't work. Right. Yeah. And so there is a lot of good information out there. But what I would say to new teachers is, um, first of all, we have to be careful about our own emotions. Right. Because we don't want to um, respond or react out of our own fear, our own anger, our own frustration, you know, whatever that is. So first we have to make sure we're in the right, we're, we're good to go mm-hmm. to have a conversation with the students. So maybe we don't want to do that when anything, when we're hot. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it's about the same kind of frame. It's saying to a student, listen, when it was time to transition into math, I asked you four or five times to get your book out, to get, and, and we don't do this publicly in front of a whole class, right? Let's make right, that right. back in the clip charts. If we need to have a conversation with a student about behavior, we're going to do that in a way that preserves that child's dignity and can be a productive conversation. Because I'll tell you, if you're having a conversation with a student where they start to just feel threatened or attacked, mm-hmm. You get the same violation of safety. They go in neurologic, like in our brains, we leave behind all of our rational thinking and we we dig back down into biologically that fight, flight, freeze, you know, kind of mentality where we just want to get out of the conversation. Yeah. And if you've got a student who's just standing there uncomfortable thinking, how do I get out of this conversation? I'm in so much trouble. My parents are going to be so mad at me. My teacher doesn't like me anymore. I'm a mm-hmm. horrible person. Whatever. They are not listening to you. They're not making sense of the situation. And you will not see improvement from that. Right? Because they're not going to under- They're not going to come away with yeah. any new understanding. So a conversation that says, this is what was going on. This is why it was a problem. And here's what I want to see next time. And I know you can do it. Mm-hmm. It's a much more effective conversation. And when we have really good, strong relationships with our students, we also know when something's just not right. And when we can pull a, a kid aside and say, it took you four times to get your math book out. You're not on your game today. Can I help you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there something you need from me? What can I do so that the rest of the day goes better than what we've had going on this morning? You know, when we do, there's so much embedded in a, in a snippet like that. Yeah. From from the empathy to the compassion to the the relationship strengthening that you can you can strengthen a relationship with a student out of a conversation where they are demonstrating problematic behavior. Mm-hmm. Right. It doesn't all have to go downhill. That's right. That's right. Um, but it also is building for that student self-awareness some self-reflective thinking, asking them to to consider what they need and mm-hmm. to learn how to ask for that. Those are those life skills. Yeah. Um I, I think it's great to to pull a child offline if you if you have to have that mm-hmm. kind of conversation. I always I, I don't think it's ever a good idea to to arbitrarily uh embarrass a kid in class. No. I, I just you know and or yeah absolutely yeah um uh, yeah, I was going to ask you to, to kind of piggyback off that question. I mean, wh- what is your take on a timeout situation, a timeout center, or a timeout area? You know, you know. So or, what oh, I so. what I prefer to see in a classroom, and students can have a role in creating this. Mm-hmm. But what I prefer to see is a space in the classroom for us to re-regulate when we need to. Okay. So is it your cool down corner, your calm corner, Mm -hmm. your zen den, you know, your zen zone, you know, whatever, you know, whatever might tie into a a bigger school-wide conversation. Is it, you know, your, your, you know, some kind of nest, you know, Uh something in your classroom. But 
Uh, and and then you you teach that right along from the beginning. We are people, and, yeah. and we are first and foremost emotional beings, right? I think it's Jill Bolt who is the neurologist who has that quote about um, we are feeling creatures who think, right? Mm-hmm. We're not thinking, folks. We're feeling, folks. First, yeah. And so teaching about emotions and teaching from the get-go that we all need time and space and to learn how to know when you need a moment and to go take it in a safe, effective way, mm-hmm. that's amazing life skill. Yeah, work. So, so this is something that they would just get up and do or is this something a teacher would direct a kid to go to so if, it can be both it can be both it can be both or and it there can should be, be a time either. limit on this right um, i mean they don't so, yeah usually yeah. forgive me usually yeah. what you might do is you would have um a a timer or something in that space mm-hmm. right and maybe you have more than one maybe you have a three minute timer or a five minute timer and a seven minute timer and kind of depending on the what the situation is, yeah, yeah. you're right. And sometimes you may have students who would just go there because they want to. Um, and sometimes you might have a student where you can see that they need it and you're going to prompt that, you yeah. know, and, um, and, but, but part of what's important going back to our, our whole foundational conversation here is making it part of the norms, right? It, it has to be something that's just part of what we do in here mm-hmm. that everyone has access to and that we all use at different times and we have to teach it and practice it just yeah. like everything else. Like any other routine. Yeah. Yes. So that there's no there's no sense of shame or embarrassment in using that resource and making use of that space. And we know how to do it appropriately. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, um, how does the concept of establishing a learning community extend beyond, you know, the physical classroom and involve uh, collaboration with parents, administrators and, yeah. and you know, and other stakeholders? So um, that that was part of that conversation we, we started a few minutes ago about uh-huh. the idea that in an ideal world, what yeah. we were able to do is tie in what we're doing in our classrooms with the bigger picture of what's happening. If you have a multi-tiered system in your school and you're looking at tier one, you know, tier one things are going to be those school-wide rules, you know, school-wide expectations, school-wide values. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe your school has, has some kind of a mantra. I worked in a district for a long time where every day at the end of the announcements, students heard work hard, be kind. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I, I used to think that's all you need, right? Like that's yeah. all we need in the world yeah. is to work hard and be kind. Um, and so when you can make those connections to the bigger picture, that's really important. And you want to bring parents into the conversation. You, when, you, when you as a teacher and as a classroom establish a, a classroom, whatever it is, compact, contract, you know, set of, of expectations, Parents should be should know what those are. Yeah. Communicate that. Think That's about it. how you're communicating with your families about everything you're doing. Do you send home a weekly newsletter? Do you tell families what's upcoming in science? Do you tell them what's upcoming in, in reading next week? Well, you can also tell them what's going on in terms of how you're celebrating you know, great things that are happening in the classroom. You can talk about how you're talking about good communication. Um, you can highlight leadership in your classroom. You know, part of being a member of a community is that sense of ownership and leadership in the community. So students having a leadership role is uh-huh. really, really important. Talk to parents about what that looks like in the classroom. Um, so having those bigger conversations. And, you know, the other thing that's really important um, you know, for my hope for leaders that are listening is recognizing that what's good for the kids is good for the grown-ups. You know, it kids need psychological safety in the classroom. Absolutely. Guess what? We all need it in the workplace. <laughs> Absolutely. Huh? You know, and the root of this research. So a lot of the, the root of the, the research in psychological safety, that's from Dr. Amy Edmondson, who's a Harvard 
business professor uh-huh. who did this work in in hospitals, you know, looking at teams, looking at why people speak up or don't speak up, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what it is that creates the most effective teams. And, and it, the foundation of it is psychological safety. So teachers need that. We need to be strong teams. We need to feel that way with one another. We need to know it's okay to make mistakes. We need to know it's okay to ask for help. We yeah. need to know where to ask for help and who to ask for help <laughs> and how to find all of the things that we need. Because while all of this is doable, it's a whole heck of a lot easier to do it when we do it together. Absolutely. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Well, Cheryl, let me ask you this. If You know, for our new teachers that are listening, and for the others as well, what is the biggest takeaway that you would like to share with our audience? I mean, if you had to pick one thing, what would that be? (laughs) Um, I don't know if I'm picking one thing, but 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 I will say, you know, uh, the the big takeaway is um, how important um, creating the conditions for learning are. How important that healthy well-being, a healthy learning environment is, and that that means not only physical safety, but it means psychological safety, Mm -hmm. and that as teachers, we are the leaders of our learning communities. We are the leaders of our classroom organizations, and so what that means is we need to make that its own goal before anything else. That my first goal is going to be to create a healthy, strong learning community where my students can thrive. Absolutely. Thank you. And I have to ask you, how can folks connect with you? So probably the easiest way to to continue this conversation, which I would obviously love to be able to do. You're hitting on all my passions today. (laughs) Um, But that's through LinkedIn. Okay. Just go visit me on LinkedIn. And I do try to, to post um, great examples that I see in classrooms. Mm-hmm. And um, we talked about, you know, bridging that research to application. So I do that work on my LinkedIn page, trying to take some of the research that's out there and do the work for you of translating it uh-huh. into <laughs> something that's more accessible that um, makes more sense and that is more practically connected with what we're doing in our classrooms every day. So, you know, let's continue the conversation, but maybe there's, you know, maybe I can add some value or give you something useful that you can walk away with, even if uh, if that's, you know, what it is it means. All right. Outstanding. And Cheryl, I just want to say, I want to thank you uh, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show today to share your expertise with our audience. And I'll tell you, at some point in the future, I'd love to have you back on again. I mean, I know our audience has got, got tons of gold nuggets today. So <laughs> I want to thank you, and you have an awesome day, and we'll talk soon, okay? Thank Bye. you so much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Well, my friend, we have come to the end of today's episode. But before we go, let me ask you something. Are you ready to transform your teaching with a diverse array of educational resources? Well, if so, explore our membership program. Choose from three plans to fit your preferences and enjoy a seven-day free trial to experience the value firsthand. Visit teacherclassroomresources.com forward slash membership hyphen options. I want to thank you for listening to the Teacher Rockstar Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hiles. We'll see you same time, same place next week. And remember, my friend, you got this. The Teacher Rockstar Podcast with your host, Steve Hiles. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we have. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and join our growing community of teacher rockstars. Until then, thanks for listening.